Okay, I'm going to start. I am really going to start in a second. Okay, welcome, E123, lecture 28. Woo! We're getting towards the end. And today's one of my favorite topic, favorite topics, phase response, phase. Everything's about phase. You know, the phase you are right now in school, you know, it's, it's some, something of a phase too. Phase is a wonderful thing. Uh, and today we're going to talk more, more specifically what it is. Uh, maybe you won't appreciate it now, but I'm sure you'll appreciate it at some point in your life when you reach that phase. Okay, so before this, uh, any uh, problems? Uh, everybody having a good time with uh, Lab 5? Yeah? Success transmitting? Yeah, could be. There's more than one speaker output? Right. And you don't know which one is which? Okay. Yeah, I'll try. So it's, depending on your configuration, maybe you installed a driver at some point that creates these virtual also um, audio. I mean, there's lots of uh, software that would do that. And so that might be the reason. So you just need to pick up the right audio device. Uh, some computers also have, um, uh, you know, they, they use the audio device inside the laptop as a USB kind of a device too, which makes it even more confusing. Um, but, yeah, but I think it's for any other software that you need to configure an audio device, it will be the same. So you just need to figure out which one is the, is the one. Uh, every, most people are able to uh, transmit. Who's transmitting? Uh, and the rest are just not doing anything. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> just waiting. Uh, anybody transmitted um, a uh, Morse code already? <laughs> Freak me out. The next one, I'm telling you, this is the best lab ever invented in this department. However, it's if you ask like former students, I mean, it's pretty demanding. So. It's like half a project, kind of, a, of a lab. So just get this thing work, okay? Please. Uh, otherwise, I'm like I, I won't be able to sleep. Okay. Anybody having trouble sleeping? By the way, do you mind any storm sparks, auroras, unsettled solar wind conditions, arrival of weak ignition of a G two class geomagnetic storm, early hours sparked auroras that even spilled into northern United States. Okay, so that's pretty cool. But that also meant that this morning, there's just no HF. It's like dead. <laughs> Static at really high level, which was quite amazing. Because yesterday, that was not the case. Everybody was like, blah, 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 blah. And I think it's settling down now, so it should be interesting. Um, yes. It's actually fun to look at the... Um, <coughs> Space weather, it's very interesting. You think that it doesn't impact us so much because we have this atmosphere and magnetic field that protects us. But if it's really, really bad, that can actually you know, blow up uh, transformers on power lines and you know, completely destroy the entire infrastructure of a country. So it did uh, spark some really intensive um, power failures in Canada, I think, a few years ago. It was really big, uh, a, yeah, really big storm. So it's just nice to, to watch them. All right. And now for something completely different. Phase response. We talked about phase response last time. And if we just think about what is a phase response of, um, I mean, actually often, you know, like if, if you, if, you, know you, you take 20, you take 120. All the time when you look at the frequency response, most people just plot the magnitude. I mean, that's the, the one thing that, like, because we really understand it, and it's really r nice to describe. And you just plot the magnitude. 
But it's really the phase response tells, tell you, tells you so much about what is this filter, uh, filter or system going to do. And so for the case of that you just have this <coughs> uh, complex exponential, right? Uh, just a linear phase uh, um, that has a magnitude one, no effect on the magnitude response. But what it does, really, it creates this pure delay of uh, ND sampling. If this is integer, then it will delay your, your, um, your signal by ND samples. Um, why is this interesting? If we look at the actual argument or the phase response, and we separate it between uh, small letters, arg, and capital letters, arg, in the sense that the small one do not include the phase wraps of 2 pi. Okay, the capital arg does include those phase wraps. So this is would be the capital. So if you look at the phase, then it, it is a linear function of frequency. And when it's a linear function of frequency, you get this pure delay of, uh, of, your, of whatever comes out. Okay? Just a pure delay when it's a linear, and that's why we call it linear phase. But what's really interesting uh, and informative is the case where we look at the group delay, which is the negative derivative of the phase. Okay? So the negative derivative of the phase will effectively give us the actual delay that's going on. Okay? So if we take the derivative with respect to omega and negate the sign, we'll get nd, which is the actual delay that we're getting in the filter. So we talked last time about uh, group delay, again, defined as the negative derivative of the phase with respect to frequency. And why is that interesting? Because when you have a non or an arbitrary phase function as a function of frequency, an arbitrary phase response, um, what does really the group delay tell us? What it tells us really is for a narrow band pulse or a narrow band signal that I'm going to transmit at around a particular frequency, that narrow band pulse will only see um, the the phase response, you know, close, you know, around that uh, vicinity of these frequencies. Okay, so if I send a pulse around uh, omega one in frequencies, it will only see really the phase response here. And what it will actually see, if we, you know, if it's narrow band enough, what it will actually see is just the slope of that function. Okay, so anything if you think about Taylor approximation. Right of a function, uh, what is the uh, Taylor approximation? You'll take the value of the function, and then you take the you know first derivative of it, and the second derivative, and so on and so forth. Right. So the first, the the only thing that it would really see is kind of the approximation of what is the slope. Is really just going to see uh, is just going to see the slope of that function. So it's going to see a, a linear phase, and what is the linear phase that we have here is really just the group delay. Okay, so it's the derivative of the phase, uh, the, um, the um, negative derivative of the phase with respect to the um, um, frequency. And so this narrowband pulse will actually see a slope in the phase, which what really it means is that that pulse is going to be delayed by, by that value, okay? which is the, uh, the group delay. So uh, a pulse at omega 1 will be de delayed by a certain amount. A pulse uh, around omega 2, a narrowband pulse around omega 2, will be delayed by a different amount. And that is called dispersion. The fact that you put something into a system and then different frequencies are delayed by different amounts, that is actually called dis dispersion. Happens, for example, propagation of light inside materials. Right? You'll see different frequencies are delayed by different amounts, so you've got the uh, dispersion of the, uh, of the spectrum. Okay? Um, so for a, a linear phase system, the group delay is just ND. For a nonlinear phase system, then the group delay varies with frequency. Yes? So the Advancement, yeah. That's right, yeah. It, well, first of all, non-causal systems have a positive group delay. Turns out you can have, even in a causal system, 
even for a causal system, you can have a positive group delay for some frequencies. Okay? Um, it doesn't mean that it is a non-causal system. What it means is that you would be able to see a pulse kind of arriving before, but it's more based on prediction. So if you have a narrowband pulse, it's, it's something that's really easy to predict just by you know, small, any small changes that it has. So it's just you could predict up front that it's going to do the slope. And because it's narrow band, then it will have to behave that way. Okay, So it's not necessarily. So there is a negative group delay for a causal system, but it cannot be on all frequencies. It will have to be on just a finite, you know, just a small part of the frequency, and um, yeah, and we we might mention it a little bit, and maybe I'll give you an example next time of what it actually means. Okay. But in general, if the entire frequency space is has a positive uh, group delay, then that really means that the system is non-causal. So here's just an example that I had before where I have a narrow band pulse. You see it's a narrow band pulse. Right? It has a pure frequency and it's, it's kind of windowed. right? So it's, uh, that spreads it a little bit. So it's not just a single delta function. It spreads a little bit because we window it. Uh, and now by now you know how much it spreads by the size of the window and so on and so forth. I think this was Hamming windowed. And when you, we play omega 1, omega 1 will see uh, quite a significant slope. And it will delay by a certain, you know, here in this case, it was delayed by about 150 samples. And omega-2 um, is not delayed by, by much. And it would I think it was delayed by just a few samples. And so effectively, this pulse kind of passed by the other one. Right? That's pretty cool. But basically, it means that it kind of messes up any signal that comes in. Right, if I speak and I pass that through the system, then it's going to you know, mix my signal. The cool thing about it, though, is that I can pass it again through a system that does the opposite, and everything will come back. Okay? So of course, with a constant delay, right, everything would be constantly delayed, but I can maybe cancel those effects. Okay? So where does this happen, so it's, you know, this moving around thing? Yeah. How about a chirp? Like a filter, which is a chirp. Right? That that's kind of does that exactly what you were saying. Right? It it will only have an inner product with the right with the right frequency that happening every time. Yeah. So it will spread it around. You can take a, a pulse and spread it around. And you can also do the opposite and you know put it back. Uh, since this, there's no attenuation, it's just about delaying frequencies. Okay, so as long as you're willing to suffer a constant delay at the end, right? You cannot really advance it back on a on a causal system. But if you're willing to suffer a constant delay, then that's possible. And actually, they do that with um, with optics, where they you know they, they put a pulse uh, they um, they put a pulse through fiber uh, fiber optic line. And then there's dispersion that's happening, and you know the, all the pulses kind of like you know die off. There's a, there's a nice behavior there is that because if you have a high amplitude in uh, some of these fibers, then there's a nonlinear behavior. So it's good actually to create this dispersion because then behavior is linear because everything is kind of really low amplitude. And then at the end, you put a material that uh, over a short amount of distance compensates for all these phases, and then oop, you've got everything coming back. It's not a nonlinear system. It's a nonlinear phase. Okay, that's different. Nonlinear phase, not necessarily nonlinear system. Okay. It is a linear system. It's even an LTI system that we're talking about. Okay, so it is possible to do these kind of weird delays. The different frequencies will delay by a certain amount, and that is determined by the group delay of that particular system. So let's talk about you know this group delay math. If we look at the um, at the transfer function, uh, remember we have uh, zeros on the top, we have the poles on the bottom, uh, and we'd like to see what is 
really the phase response or the or eventually the group delay of this of this system. Okay, and so these are uh, in fact uh, the roots of these of the polynomials of the uh, of the transfer function, and since this is mu multiplicative, and phase is in the exponent, right? When we take the argument, then basically those phases add. Okay, the phases <laughs> add. Um, the one for the poles will be with a negative, okay, because they're on the bottom sides of the, they're in the de denominator, and those corresponding to the zeros will have a positive effect on the phase. Okay, so. Uh, the argument of this expression, since this is a zero, will be positive. The argument of this expression will be negative, since this is a pull. Okay? When we look at the group delay, this is just a derivative. And so derivative doesn't actually affect uh, that fact. And so it still adds. And now um, what you'll get is, again, it's the uh, group delay of the individual contribution of each one of these uh, roots of the polynomial, okay? So again, uh, for uh, poles, since they're, they're in the denominator, they will subtract, they'll have a negative sign, whereas uh, um, zeros will have a positive sign. Now, if you actually want to look at what is the contribution itself, uh, what we could look at, let's look, just look at one, uh, either a zero or a pole. It doesn't really matter. We're just going to have a, a sign on the, in the up front. We can express this as a complex number. So uh, instead of C, K, or D, K, we can just write it as some R, E, to the J, uh, theta. Okay? This is the polar representation or phasor representation of this um, C, K, or D, K coefficient. Um, which, in fact, if you actually do some algebra, would lead to that the argument of this is just this really nasty expression, inverse tangent of this R sine, and so on and so forth. Okay? For the group delay, again, if you do some linear algebra, you'll get basically dependent on R square and the cosine of the difference between omega and theta, and on the bottom, so on and so forth. Great. Yeah. But this is really not what I'd like you to get out of this, maybe we'll try to figure out kind of like a geometric in intuition. In the same way that we looked at the amplitude response, we can get a geometric in uh, um, intuition of what, or interpretation of what is the phase response. And so if you look at the actual, uh, what does it really mean? Okay? If you look at um, a, um, a pole or uh, a pole is zero, right? it, it doesn't matter right now, because the pole is zero, uh, that is at position R on the real axis. Okay. Let's see what is the phase response corresponding to this particular polar zero. Once we figure out one, then we just need to add it to other ones. They just the phases just add. Okay, so the phase response just adds, so that that's pretty easy. So let's look at just one. Okay, um, so for this one. I'm just going to write 1 minus R E minus J omega because the, uh, the coefficient really, um, or CK or DK, is really just R. Okay? Uh, the phase is uh, 0. So theta equals 0 in this case. So the argument of this is I can do some uh, linear algebra here and just write it down as E plus J omega minus R multiplied by E minus J omega because if I multiply this, with this, they cancel. They give you 1. And if I multiply this by this, they give you this exact expression. Okay, So this is equivalent to this. Okay, Now I'm going to take the argument of this two individual terms, right? because ar the argument actually adds. And so the arg what I'm going to look now is the argument of E j omega minus r minus the argument of E j omega. What's the argument of E j omega? Omega, right? That's the that's the phase of the e, e j omega is omega. And what is the phase of E j omega minus r? Well, what is E j omega minus r? Is the actual angle um, phi. Okay, so. If you think of what is actually the argument of all this, is really just phi 
minus omega, which correspond to this angle. So if I, if I put a vector between r and the, and the place on the unit circle that I want to see what the frequency response is, I'm going to look at the, this angle between r, this position, and 0. Okay? So that angle here is really the phase response. So the phase response corresponding to this argument is going to look like this as a function of frequency. Let's see how it makes sense. Okay. I'm going to look at one, two, three, four points where this is the position of my zero pole. When, um, when I'm looking at omega equals zero, I'm going to create a, now this triangle and look at the, at the phase, the phase of uh, the angle. The angle is going to be zero, right? Because now I'm, I'm putting a vector here and then another here, and the triangle is collapsed now, so the angle is zero. As I move along here, it starts in opening up. Okay, The angle opens up, and you reach a point where it's maximum. Okay, So this is this point where it's maximal. I think this is the maximum point. I'm just going to eyeball this. Okay, And then you continue on, then it starts going to start closing. Okay, It's going to start closing. Uh, it's almost linear. It's actually not linear, right? but it's almost linear. It's going to start close, close till we get to this point, which correspond here. Okay, so now it's about half as wide. And then when we're going to get to uh, pi, it's going to go back to zero. And then on the other side, I get exactly the opposite effect. Okay, so this is really the phase response corresponding to this particular pole. Now I can put you know many poles or zeros and you know. Uh, each one of them will contribute either you know the opposite of the of that response, but it's pretty easy to then you know figure out what is the actual frequency response just by a uh, phase response just by eyeballing it. What about the um, the group delay? The group delay, if if you can see here, uh, the group delay is the negative slope, right, of the phase response. Here, the phase response has a positive slope, so the group delay is. Negative, okay. Right. And at some point, it reaches a, a, a you know, when it kind of slopes slopes down. That's the, where the group delay is zero, right? Exactly when it slopes, and that's this point over here. Okay. And then it's going to be almost linear, so the group delay would be almost constant. And then at some point uh, here, it's going to start tapering down again reach zero at this point, and then uh, to the minimum point when we reach 2 pi. Okay. What does it mean on frequencies uh, corresponding to, uh, to DC or close to DC? The low frequencies, what would happen to them? Would be or delayed, depending on, <laughs> depending on if it's a zero over a pole. And then, um, and then so on and so forth. Okay, and those will be advanced or delayed. Okay, does it make sense? Any questions? So it's really just all about. I mean, what is really phase response? Right, phase. Right, when I have a cosine, right, it's just where it starts. Right? That's, that's what phase is. Right? It's just where it starts, at zero. And so what phase response does is exactly what it means. If I put a cosine with a zero phase at that frequency, it's going to come out with some phase with respect to what I sent. And if it's delayed, that's the phase response. If it's exactly the same phase, then there's no delay, right? and so on and so forth. That, that's really what it means. It's all about delaying. And then, of course, if I start adding all these frequency, you know, all these delays at different frequencies, then I would get, you know, kind of bulk shifts of, you know, different behaviors. Okay, whether it's going to spread or come back and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, what about if I don't have theta equals zero? So here, theta equals zero, but what if theta is not equal zero? So what if now my uh, r, you know, this pole is here? 
all is zero. What would happen to the response? Yeah, it's just going to rotate, right? So it's circularly going to be circularly shifted. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, so let, let's let, look at some an example. So uh, poles increase magnitude. Okay, when you put a pole next to the the unit circle, it will amplify the magnitude response, but it will also introduce a lot of phase lag and group delay. Okay. Zeros will actually do the opposite. Okay, they will attenuate the magnitude, and will reverse the effect of the phase. And these effects are going to be more significant when the pole or zero approaches the unit circle. Okay? So here's an example uh, where uh, we look at, um, is this a pole or a zero? Effect of a pole or a zero? Who said a zero? Who said a zero? Why? Decreasing the magnitude. Yeah, so it is a zero. That's right. Absolutely correct. So this is a this is a high pass or low pass or what? What is this? It's a low pass system, right? It's a low pass system where the zero where is located on pi, right? So this is a, a low pass system where the zero is located on pi. So there's a lot of information that we can see here from both the magnitude and the um, and the phase response, just about what the system is, of course. As the zero gets closer to the unit circle, we get more and more attenuation. Okay, remember the peg. Peg in, and then it's just going to go to zero there. Okay, so in this case, it actually went to zero because it was on the unit circle. What about the phase response? If you think about the angle, right? The, how does the angle, like the the angle in the triangle, right? How does it? varies when the zero is really close to the, uh, the center of the complex plane. Change is really slow, actually. Right? It's really far away. Let's go back and, and illustrate that. What if my uh, R was here? Like in the middle. There's really actually there, there will be, um, yeah, the angle will be just nothing. It will be exactly the same, right? The, uh, the angle will com collapse. It will always be, you know, aligned, okay? It will always, always be zero, effectively. So that's why zeros at the unit circle don't contribute anything, okay? As you move closer, now there's triangle that is, that is created, okay? And there's more significant angle as we move it around. And you can see that in the phase response over here. When, when, the, um, when the zero is really far away from the, uh, from the unit circle, then you know, it doesn't, doesn't attain as much. And also the phase is kind of tapered. The phase is kind of tapered. You see the exact same response that you saw before, but now it's kind of like tapered. And as you get closer and closer, the phase become more and more extreme. And as it reaches zero, okay, as, as it reaches actually on top of the unit circle, then what you've got is a linear phase with a discontinuity. Okay? A linear phase with a discontinuity. That happens at this point, and a discontinuity of how much? Of pi. And where does this happen, actually? Remember when we had, like, a, remember when we look at the frequency response of a uh, rect function? Right? That should be, like, a, p, uh, a sink, right? What's the frequency response of a rect function? Periodic sink. Well, you should have said, well, are you asking continuous rect or, right, or a discrete rect? Discrete rect would be a periodic sink. And a periodic sink has zero crossing, right? 
That's because the, zero, the zeros actually lie on the unit circle. And if you remember the phase response, right? Phase response, we saw these jumps of pi, right? That show the sign on the, on the sink, right? That's exactly when the zeros are on the unit circle. That's what happens. That's why you see this. Now what about, here's another example of a second order IAR. So it has this form, okay? Has complex poles, so poles on, um, um, so it's a, it's a low pass, band pass, band stop, what is it? Band, band pass, that's right. Because those frequency, that's the log magnitude, so those frequency are amplified, and that frequency is attenuated, right? So it passes those frequencies. And why we have two of them? Real coefficient, right? So we have a complex conjugate pair, okay? So um, in that case, the coefficients are real. So this is the magnitude response. And here is the phase response, okay, corresponding to this uh, filter. And now it's a little bit more complex because these two effects from these two, um, these two poles uh, is added together, so it's kind of mixed. But effectively, you see that there's a positive you know, value over here, and then it kind of drops down. Here it's kind of almost linear, and then there's kind of a wiggly here. And if you look at the derivative of this, which is what really tells us how much delay we're going to have if we put a narrow, uh, narrow band pulse on those frequencies, and you see that you can have a significant amount of delay of almost eight, um, eight samples for those frequencies. So if I sent a narrow band pulse around that particular frequency corresponding to this point, yeah, it is going to be ampli uh, am amplified quite a bit. But at the same time, it's also going to be delayed quite a bit by at least eight samples in this case. And you notice that this one will be advanced. All right, and here's another example. This is a third order um, uh, IR filter. So these are the, uh, it has uh, three poles here and it has one, two, three zeros. Uh, if you look at the log magnitude, what is this, a uh, low pass, high pass? It's a what? Is it, is it? It's a low pass filter, right? It's passes the frequencies up to about pi over uh, six, something like this, right? Uh, what about the, um, you know, there's, there's some ripple, so it's not like a, remember we, I mentioned kind of the type of uh, designs, right? I mentioned there's a Chebyshev design, there's a elliptic, and then there's the Butterworth, right? Definitely not Butterworth because it has some ripple in the pass band, it has some ripple in the stop band. Okay. Um, okay, so there's some frequencies where you could see that uh, the function almost goes to zero, or actually zero, and probably this is because there's not enough accuracy in the graph. So it goes to zero over here, and it goes to zero over here, and it goes to zero over here. That means that it has three zeros on the unit circle. One, two, three zeros on the unit circle. And then over here, You've got three poles which amplify um, the points here, and those create kind of this ripple, effectively. Okay, one here, and then one here, and then one over here. Okay, those kind of push, you know, push the path band, where these want to pull it, pull it down. Okay, so that's why you've got this ripple, effectively, because the poles kind of push it. Okay, and in between the poles, in those frequency between the poles, it kind of is going to taper down a little bit. What about the phase response? Phase response is quite complex. We hear it's the phase response with, um, is that arg with an A or arg with a capital A or arg with a lowercase a?
How much jump is this? What? Two pi, right? Yeah, so it's a arg with a capital, right? OK. And then the group delay, again, you see uh, next to, you know, around this uh, pull, uh, there is some group delay. It's not as much as from here because this is a little bit away from the unit circle compared to this one. Okay, this one's a little bit away from the unit circle, so it's only about three and a half kind of sample delay, and here it's almost uh, nine or almost ten for these points. Okay, in the amount of delay. Um, Yes, the, the the inverse the the negative derivative of the of the unwrapped phase gives you the group delay. The negative of that, right? The negative of this. I said exactly without those jumps, without the pi jumps, and the two pi jumps. Okay, if you don't account for those. Because those are singular points that don't create this delay. All right, so now we have some idea of um, some ideas of how the phase behaves when we have a you know a systems uh, um, a rational uh, transfer function okay for an LTI system. We have some idea of how the frequency response behaves. You know how far we are from poles, how far we are from zeros. And you know what about um, again the uh, the op yeah the opposite. Okay, so now what I want to talk about is a few types of systems. We're going to talk about all pass systems, and we're going to talk about minimum phase systems. Okay. So the real question is uh, that I have to you is what is the magnitude response of this transfer function? By the way, this is my hand right. Yeah. What is the magnitude response of um, of this frequency response that uh, has the following behavior, where we've got a pole located at a and a zero at one over a conjugate? So our, yeah. If you yeah, one over a conjugate basically um, zeroes this point, and then a uh, nulls this point. Okay, so this is a pole here at a, and this is a one over a. What happens there? Okay, what if I had a, actually a pole and a zero at the same position? They would cancel, right? They would cancel. But now, the pole and zeros are not the same position, but they're in a peculiar case where the zero is at a position which is 1 over a star. Okay. If you kind of do the math, and you say, OK, let's put e minus j omega on, you know, instead of z, because we're going to evaluate on the unit circle. So z minus 1 is e minus j omega minus a star. On the bottom is 1 minus a e to j omega. I'm going to do kind of a trick right now where I'm going to take 1 uh, e minus j omega from the top, which is going to leave 1 minus a star e to j omega over here. Yep. And e to j omega comes out. And then the same thing over here. And I'm, again, looking at the magnitude response, at the magnitude response. And so now uh, the magnitude of this is 1, right? So I really just need to look at the magnitude of this and with ratio to the magnitude of this. And uh, lo and behold, as it turns out, the magnitude is exactly the ratio between them. As it comes out, is exactly the same. They have exactly the same magnitude. So when I have a, uh, a case where my zero 
is at a position which is 1 over conjugate position of a pole. So I've got these pair. Then the magnitude response, or the contribution between them, completely cancels. However, what, does it ca what doesn't cancel, necessarily? Hmm. Because something has to happen here, right? I have like a pull, I have a zero. Yeah, the magnitude response cancel, but the phase response is actually different. And so the magnitude response is really going to be different, but there might be some phase response. And so this is kind of a, what a general all-pass system would be. Uh, an all-pass system is a system that passes all frequencies with the same magnitude. Okay? But it might actually do something to the phase. For example, a system that is, produces exactly the same output as the input, that's an all-pass system. Great. A system of pure delay, right? that's an all-pass system. But there could be a system which will have, let's say, some phase response, but no magnitude response. That will be also an all-pass system. And all of these have the, for, uh, the following form. Um, for all the real roots, okay? so you have roots, the real poles and zeros, um, they have to have the relationship that um, you've got this dk over here and basically dk on the other side. Okay? So they effectively, this is this behavior. When you have a pull over here, then you have a 0 at 1 over that. And for the case where you've got complex poles and zeros, then those will be basically 1 over conjugate. All this, this, if you have a system in this type of form, then its magnitude response is going to be 1. However, if it's going to have a certain uh, frequency, uh, phase response. Okay. So here's an example of an all-pass system where you've got poles at uh, those position at uh, 0 0.8 with uh, some, uh, with a frequency, uh, with a uh, an angle of pi over 4. And so if you put a 0 on the 1 over conjugate, which is 1.25, uh, then you would get, effectively, um, a cancellation of the magnitude response of these two. And the same thing over here, and the same thing over here. But you would also have a phase response. And the phase response that comes out is very interesting. If you look at, again, at the phase response corresponding to this, you've got uh, e minus j omega minus this. This is a star. And you've got a over here. Then I can do the same trick that I had before when I, you know, I took this e minus j omega. I get this expression over here and this expression over here. The only difference between them is the minus sign. Front, uh, on the top. And when I look at now at the argument, um, this contributes to a constant omega, okay, or uh, just uh, basically minus omega, contribute from this. And this, as it turns out, is equivalent to twice the 1 minus R e j theta e minus j omega. So the contribution of this is really the same thing as this, and that they just add together. The fact that you have a 0 now on the other side, it contributes the exact opposite phase, so it has a similar phase to the uh, similar phase response to the pole. Okay, just as because it's on the other side of the unit circle. So what I get is I get twice the amount of phase contributing from the um, zero and pole pair. So the group delay for this case would be 1 minus twice the group delay of, of an individual zero or pole. Okay. So in the case that we, uh, here's an example. This is also a figure uh, S, uh, 520 in the book where you've got uh, a pair of 
zeros and poles that are located at pi over 4, uh, at the angle of pi over 4. And what you'll see is that at this location, you've got a significant accrual, accrual of phase in the phase response just because of these uh, zeros and poles with a significant amount of uh, group delay for those frequencies. But no magnitude response whatsoever. Okay, no magnitude response whatsoever. So now if you think about this, what we can do is use this. If I have a certain phase distortion in my signal that goes through some system, for example, I talk to you, there are certain delays, and different parts of the room will have different re reflectivity and maybe slightly delaying some of the uh, frequencies that are going to come back. Okay? And so I'm going to get kind of a dispersion that happens when, when I receive the signal, all the echoes. Then I could potentially create a system that would be able to fix some of that. Okay, by delaying different frequencies back into the same by the same you know, by the right amount. Okay, so they all, you know, so the dispersion that I get is uh, is canceled. Okay, yes. Um, for the the IIR bandpass filters we saw before, they had those hanging out of spikes. Right. So would we have to have like a whole bunch of these to spike everything else out? Yeah. So the IIR actually had spiked in the same place, right? So what do I need to do in order to compensate for this? What I could do is not have spikes in these positions and have basically delay for the other, all the other frequencies that will effectively delay the entire thing, but everything will be, you know, all the nonlinear effects will cancel. Okay, so if I only, you know, if the IR before had these delays, right? But the other frequencies next to them were not delayed as much. So now I can create a system which create a lot of delay for this, but not much for this. And then I will get a constant delay, which is maybe significant, about you know, 20 samples right, delay, but it will be a constant delay for everything, all frequencies together. So I'm going to be able to compensate for some of these delays by using these type of IR systems. Okay, if I have a nonlinear filter, that I'm willing to use, nonlinear phase response filter that I'm willing to use, where should I have a nonlinear phase filter that I'm willing to use? Maybe in the analog domain. The analog domain is really hard to create linear phase filter. Right? It might be sometimes even not possible. Okay? So I'm going to have this nonlinear phase delay, uh, nonlinear phase in the uh, continuous domain. Once I get into the digital domain, I can design something that will compensate for all these delays, okay, and remove some of these distortions. Yep. Is it computationally efficient to add all of those poles and zeros? What do you mean? Um, well, if you need to have spikes everywhere for those two frequencies, you might need to add stuff all around the pole zero. I mean, what you really want to do is you want to create, right? You want to you want to be able to approximate then a filter that if that was the phase response of the analog domain, right, you want to create a digital filter that will have a phase response together with this one that will be linear. Or as linear as possible. So you might want to design something of a finite length or a finite number of parameters that will approximate a linear phase. That will compensate for this nonlinearity and will give you just a pure delay. Of course, sometimes you will need an infinite number of, you know, you have to use a lot of, uh, like a large order in order to really cancel everything. But with a small order filter, you might be able to, you know, cancel the majority. Right? Even when we design a low pass filter, it's not perfect, right? It meets some of our criteria. And so in this case, we, want to design maybe something of a low order that meets some criteria, criteria in terms of the compensating for all this distortion. Does this make sense? And so that is really, really powerful. Okay. Um, so how about we finish uh, right here, and then 
We'll continue uh, next time on Monday and talk about, uh, first of all, on Monday, I'm going to talk a little bit about the projects. And then we're going to move on to talk about minimum phase systems. And minimum phase systems are, you know, you don't necessarily appreciate them, what, you know, what they actually do right now. But they have um, wide use a lot in, you know, speech processing. Actually, we use them in MRI. There's a good reason for use what's called a minimum phase system, so systems that gives you the minimum amount of delay. Um, so there's a lot of reasons how to use them. And we're going to talk about those type of systems. We're going to talk about the case where you're going to have a certain system with a certain magnitude response. And you'll see that for that particular magnitude response, there might be a lot of options of filters that re or systems that realize this exact magnitude response but have completely different phase responses. So exact same magnitude response, but completely different uh, phase responses. And we're going to talk about those. Okay? And so have a nice weekend, and I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>